Yeah, so I'm Josh. Um, you can email me, jmarinacci at mozilla.com. It's very hard to spell because my last name is hard to spell. So just josh at josh.earth. Same, same place. Uh, I'm officially on the developer relations team, but I am assigned to mixed reality. Uh, and even though we have a lovely office across the street, um, I do not work there. I work out of Eugene. Um, if you learn nothing else in this talk, I want you to know what mixed reality is and that it works on the web today. We've got lots of cool things coming in the future, but you can start with it right now. And I'm going to go through some of the cool stuff. Um, and Mozilla is hiring, so walk across the street. And uh, first thing you'll get when you join is one of these awesome customized hoodies. Here. And the first four people to ask a question will get some cool swag, because I know that you want this. Yes. And I only have two of these. <laughs> okay, so at, at Mozilla, we think of not virtual reality and augmented reality, but mixed reality is a spectrum of all of these things. Um, and a different, a particular experience, a particular form factor has a certain space on the spectrum. But they all use much of the same technology. On the AR side, augmented reality is when you have a live view of reality and you are overlaying something on it, preferably interacting with something in the real world. Um, now, I'll note this looks really pretty and awesome, and that is actually from a completely fake video that Microsoft did, because no one's real countertop looks like that. Mine's covered in banana peels and, and Lego bricks. But we also have a lot of things in there between. Uh, the ill-fated Google Glass, but some of their ideas are, are going to come on. Um, HUDs, which largely are, are, are not interacting with reality, but it's overlaying important information on top of reality. And then, of course, probably what most of you had as your first AR experience was Pokemon Go. On the VR side, we're talking about complete immersion, um, which requires some actually what used to be pretty steep hardware requirements these days can be done pretty easily. But wide field of view, ideally, fast refresh rate. And I want you to know that the future is a lot closer than you think. When you probably hear AR glasses, you're thinking of something like this. You know, this fully wrap around, I don't know why you'd want code and bar charts in your eyeballs, but <laughs> presumably, you know, this is clearly a mock-up. And yet, Magic Leap is going to release this sometime this year. Um, and Intel has already released prototype hardware that gives you a lot of what Google Glass promised, but completely integrated into something that looks like normal glasses and has decent battery life. On the VR side, you're probably really thinking of like the holodeck, right? We're not quite there yet, but there are places that have set up full multi-user immersive experiences. And I realize they, they look really weird from the outside, but I assure you on the inside, it looks much cooler. <laughs> so what's available now? Um, at the high end, you've got a headset that runs $500 to uh, $1,000 uh, for getting all the sensors and things and requires a PC. This was state-of-the-art about three years ago. Um, PlayStation VR. Uh, th this past fall, Microsoft jumped in and drastically reduced the price. So you can get a headset for two to $300, um, plus maybe another 100 for controllers that does a really good job and does not require you to, to like drill holes in your wall and set up giant beacons. Um, if you already have a phone, which I'm going to assume 100 out of 100 of you in this room have a phone, you can use something like Google Daydream or Gear VR for about $100, where you slip your phone in this thing. Or on the low end, Google Cardboard, build it yourself. Um, it has one button at most, generally input is gaze. And it seems really cheesy, and yet, this is where most people are going to get their first kind of VR experience. And you can still do a lot of stuff with this. My six-year-old loves looking at YouTube 360 on the Google Cardboard. On the AR side, a couple years ago, Microsoft released the HoloLens, started $4,000. As of last year, you can get basically the same thing for half the price. And then Apple uh, launched ARKit which does a lot of the same things you would get out of this $4,000 thing, purely through optics, using the camera built into the device you already have. And of course, uh, Android has an equivalent AR core. 
And with the iPhone X, uh, their new depth sensing hardware, even though they're not using it for AR now, what it means is they're going to sell billions of these things and the price of depth sensing cameras is going to come down drastically. It used to be hundreds of dollars to put into the back of a phone and now they've reduced it to something like $10. So what's coming? Well, two years ago, it was $800. Um, today, about $300 for a headset. Uh, those build-your-own ones you can actually buy at the checkout line at Target. That's like my threshold for mass adoption. If it becomes an impulse buy next to the Kit Kats. Um, HTC is releasing the Vive Focus. It takes all the good things about the Vive and removes the expensive gaming laptop. So it actually has the whole computer built into it. We're guessing it'll be about $500. The Oculus Go is going to be $200 and does not require a phone or a PC. Everything is built into it. So they're now it's not doesn't have quite the high performance of a full gaming PC, but for a lot of the experiences we want to do, being able to have a dedicated device where it's like, I want to do some VR, stick it on. I don't have to launch a program and boot up my computer and set up all these other things. This is what's going to make it become mass market. So the price is going down, quality is going up. And whenever I give these talks, a lot of people say, well, this is great for video games, but what else are you going to do? It's not just games and movies, though there are some really good games, and uh, it's a really great way to watch a movie on a long flight, you know, nice and isolated. But you can take a trip to Mars. You can, this is, I'll show you a little bit of it. This is a simulation of what it would be like. Turn that down a little to actually land on Mars using current technology. And I'll skip ahead to some of the juicier, come on, does not want to let me. Anyway, you get the idea. It's a simulation and you can look around in all directions. It actually, you get the feeling of going through re-entry and landing on the planet and later you can drive the rover around. This is um, one that my, whoops. Uh, are we on the right one? Come on, you can do it. We have to skip that one. It's the dinosaur simulator. Let's see if we can get this one. Ah, there we go. Now, you can watch a video of this and get the same raw information. What you can't feel is the actual size of the dinosaur until you are sitting, it's like coming right over you and you can look up and just have that sense of scale. You know, they always describe dinosaurs in school bus lengths. Well, now you can really feel it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is my favorite. It's actually a 20 minute 360 movie about the White House. And they invented some new um, filming techniques. And you get this feeling of actually being in the Oval Office next to the president, getting to see parts of the White House you couldn't otherwise see. And it's in full 360. If you turn your head, you're going to see like some Secret Service guys over there and the producer back there. It's really incredible. On the AR side, the New York Times actually put this into their app. So um, this is taken in my hallway, showing two of the, um, the skaters doing their thing and you can like film them 360 and you can actually see like how do they get so much torque you know to do those crazy quad jumps. Snapchat has had lenses for a while but they now have these things called world lenses using AR and this is it basically drills a hole into the sidewalk or whatever floors in front of you and then a giant spider comes out and it's kind of cheesy but it's surprisingly effective. <laughs> And, you know, the, yes, it's silly stuff, but this is how it starts. This is how we begin learning how to use this new medium. And one of my favorites, I don't know if we'll be able to watch the whole thing, um, 360 view of some Russian cosmonauts actually launching microsatellites by hand, like just lobbing them out. These are shot in 360, and if you watch it without a... Uh, can I skip ahead... Is it going to let me? There we go. Let's see if we can get to. So if you watch on your desktop, you can pan like this. but And you're like, there's some astronauts. And then they've added extra information, um, you know, because they're speaking in Russian. 
So why MR on the web? Well, it works everywhere. It's open. We have a good foundation. WebGL, which is the web version of OpenGL graphics, works basically everywhere. Version 2 is coming. WebVR 1 gives us access to the headset poses, so the way your head is actually tilted and turning. And the GamePad API gives us access to all the controllers. The Immersive Web Working Group, uh, this is, a, we're not officially W3C standards chartered group yet, but we're on the path to that. But basically, it's members of Mozilla, members of Google who work on Chrome, uh, some guys from Apple and Edge. The guys from Apple don't say that much, but they're there. So we're developing common specs so that um, we won't have fracture. We won't have platform fragmentation. The stuff is going to work everywhere. And what we've, what we've come up with is called WebXR. So there's one spec that covers the, the entire spectrum of VR through AR, along with example code and tests for the different browsers. And everything is open source and on GitHub. As part of that, we release um, what we call the XR Viewer, so you is essentially a crappy web browser, but it already has these APIs built into it. Um, so you can go get this from the iOS App Store right now, and Google has an equivalent for the Android Store. And this, um, what you're going to see, is a few little demo programs, if this ever loads, that I wrote. Um, come on. There we go. Buffering, buffering. How much time do I have? Okay. I think I can get through everything. Yes? So first we think of it as both use web technology to build an app. So this is a full screen experience. Uh, I'm looking through my living room, but I built it with easy to use web technology that works everywhere. The other thing we're exploring is can augmented reality or, v or VR uh, be a part of a larger web experience? For example, I could have an online book that tells me about the space program and then um, I'm learning about the Saturn V rocket, I can push into you know an image and it would open up and show me what was the Saturn V like in my yard so I have a sense of how big it was. Um, where I think it's really going to take off is things like you go to a science museum and there's an exhibit with a QR code and maybe it's a model of Crater Lake. If you look at that model through your phone, you know, scan the QR code, it takes you to the website for the museum to a page they created. It now shows you an animated version of what the Crater Lake looked like when it was a volcano and when it exploded. Those are the sorts of experiences that I, I think are going to be really exciting. Yes? Yes, there are some groups, um, but you have to realize it's still, this is still a very new medium. In the early days of film, they took theater actors and stood a camera up next to them and recorded it. It took almost 40 years for us to develop dissolves and, and change focus uh, by you know, changing camera focus to shift the, the viewer's eye. We have to develop those conventions still. And I've only seen a couple uh, in, in the movie realm that I think are really good, like the, the people's house. Um, I think educational stuff works better because we already have an idea of what it should be like. But my dream is still like the textbook from, from Hogwarts. You know, I want this magical textbook that can do all of these things. Uh, maybe it's because I have a six-year-old, so he's, you know, he's still in that, that age. Um, so there is stuff out there. Um, in fact, some guys from our team left to go create a company called Super Medium, which is essentially a way of discovering VR content. Uh, and they basically have a VR web browser built on a lot of these technologies from Mozilla. So go check that out. 
Oh, yes, yes, I'm sorry. Okay, so um, how are you gonna get actually building some of this stuff? First, start with A-Frame. A-Frame lets you write something that looks like HTML. Um, you know, it's got HTML, you import some JavaScript, here's a body, and then we have a few custom tags. Scene, here's a box, a sphere, a cylinder, a plane, a sky. And it gives you this. And that's it. You now have objects in space that you can interact with. And it's open source. It's uh, built on a nice HTML JavaScript stack on top of 3JS. And there are community contributed components from many things like particles or physics or importing GLTF models, which I'll explain in a second. Um, if you've got a 360 image, you can drop it in and immediately start adding hotspots to it. It's very easy to get something up and running quickly. And it already has all of the code to make sure the experience works across every type of headset, every controller, all of the annoying code that nobody wants to write. It is built on top of 3JS. Once you kind of outgrow A-Frame, um, you'll probably go to 3JS. It's probably the most popular open source library for doing 3D on the web. Uh, this is a screenshot from their homepage. Each one of these is some experience built using 3JS. Now, a lot of people already are using Unity to build 3D games. So rather than asking them to rewrite in something else, we created a WebVR exporter. So it's a plugin you can get from the Unity store, um, build your experience in Unity, export it, it generates a blob of JavaScript goo that you wouldn't want to try to open up. Um, but now your experience is on the web. We've also been working with Sketchfab to sponsor these challenges. Sketchfab is a place where 3D creators, people who have actual artistic talent, unlike me, can create objects in Maya or Blender or whatever modeler they use, upload them, sell them or give them away or get recognition. And we've been doing these challenges where we decide on a theme and give away prizes for the best stuff around that theme. So we did a challenge in last fall, which produced a bunch of assets, uh, specifically low poly around the theme of medieval fantasy. So we got a lot of imps and wizards and castles and ogres. And then we started a new challenge, which I believe is still going on, um, to create experiences in A-Frame using these assets. And I will show you an example of something I did uh, in a little bit. So as part of this, um, there's many different 3D object formats in the world. We are working with some other standards committees to push GLTF, which is graphics language transfer format, I think. But basically, it's a standard format for this type of stuff that can be loaded directly into web pages. And Sketchfab, regardless of what you upload it as, will do conversions to the back end so that the files can be downloaded as GLTF. And finally, I am working on an open source mixed reality workshop, meaning I'm creating a bunch of coursework that's chopped up into half hour modules. My vision is that while I'll teach it for the first couple times, I want other people to be able to teach these workshops and customize it for the audience they have. So if you have a bunch of 10 year olds in two weeks, then you could grab this set of modules. If you have some college students, but you only have a weekend, you could work on these other modules. And it will all be open source on GitHub with the code you need, all of the images, the text, uh, recordings of me giving the workshop for you to, to learn from. So I'm re this is like my big thing for the rest of this year. So I'm really excited about this. So with that, I'm going to show you a demo of what I've been working on so far. This turned into an article I did. So this is a very simple scene. It's got a sphere and a cube, and the cube is stuck to the camera, so I can just basically wag my head to move the cube. It doesn't do anything. Now we can turn on some physics. You see those little red lines everywhere. That's debugging from the physics, and now I can hit the ball. Now I replaced it with a few objects that I found on Sketchfab. So here's my imp and a staff, and I changed the um, collision so since it'd be hard to, to actually hit it with a staff of that exact size, I essentially made the hit area bigger. So now I can go like that. <laughs> so you can go all over the place. Then add some objects. This is a little cauldron I got, some trees, added a moon. I uh, wrote a couple lines of code to randomly distribute rocks around because I didn't want to actually place 50 of those. Uh, and then, then go through, let's add some lighting. So... There's a point light for the 
the cauldron, the fire underneath the cauldron. There's an uplight with a kind of blue and white on top to give you that kind of dramatic night sense. There's white coming from the moon, and that gives us it's directional, so we get these nice shadows here. We add some sound. Uh, the sounds I found on freesound.org. Um, you can't quite hear it, but there's bubbling sounds from the bubbles. And then whenever you hit this guy, <laughs> turn off debugging, and this is the experience. And I did a, did a long two-part blog about taking you through every single step of not only the code to build this thing, but why did we make this decision? Uh, immersive and realistic are not the same thing. This is low poly. No one is going to mistake this for realistic, but you could still enjoy it. You could still be pre feel like you're present in this place where interesting things could happen, much like a cartoon. And unlike a large application, you know, I can refresh this whole thing and total its, I think, five megabytes. You know, when was the last time you got a five megabyte game off of Steam, right? <laughs> That's part of the power of the web. So mixed reality is here. It's getting better every day. I'm working on this workshop. If you are interested in collaborating with me, like having me come teach it, or you have a group of students that you'd like to teach it to, then get, send me an email. You can keep up with everything we're doing at mixedreality.mozilla.com. Are there any questions? Yes. Um, send me an email, but basically it's in my GitHub. I think it's called. It's like whack and imp, I think. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> whack and imp. <laughs> and you can see all the steps and then all the assets and where they came from in there. Yeah. Oh, let me get it. OK, next question. Yes, you. So the question was, um, can I take the example I did and make it work in a 3D headset? It already does. So the A-frame framework underneath handles all of that. So if I brought this up on my phone, um, you'll notice um, in a few of these, ah, where'd that window go? Oh, I must have closed it. Anyway, there's a little button that has kind of a headset in the lower right corner. If you tap that, it will go to multi-view, where it shows a slightly different view for each eye. All of that is built into A-Frame, so you don't have to, to write any of that code. And A-Frame itself, we're always updating. That's one of the things Mozilla is investing in. While it is an open source project, it's not really owned by us, we are doing a lot of work and investing to make sure as new controllers come out, new headsets, all of that stuff works. Would you like another one? Okay. Yes, question, um, you with the blue shirt? <laughs> There, so the question was, when you're using A-Frame, is there a way to go full screen? On desktop, yes. On mobile, it depends. There are hacks. Because of the way mobile browsers work with scroll, there are hacks to kind of work around it, but it's not perfect. That's, that's an ongoing uh, concern. So I have a um, Mozilla hat or a cardboard headset, whichever you would like. Would you like a hat or a headset? <laughs> OK, I only have one more piece of swag, but I can certainly answer more questions. <laughs> yes, you. So the question was, is A-Frame built into browsers and is it built into Safari? A-Frame itself is just a JavaScript library. What it uses is the WebGL 
APIs for rendering and the orientation, that basically the sensor APIs to get the orientation of your phone. Uh, and those are web standards that, ha that Apple has built into uh, their copies of WebKit. Yes. Um, when it comes to adopting new things, you know, it helps to have them on there. Uh, for example, uh, part of the AR, um, part of WebXR is exposing the camera. Now, it's very dangerous to let arbitrary websites just look at your camera and see whatever you're looking at, right? Um, but we also don't want to bombard people with lots of dialogues. So we've been working to create an API that will be seamless but not leak information, uh, not enable you know, a new vector for browser tracking. Um, and that we've learned that's one of Apple's priorities. Um, so it's been very helpful to have them on the, the group. Yes. So that library works with everything. It's, I mean, it's designed to be a library that you can use on your app or your web page, just like any other library. There's nothing privileged about Firefox. Um, that said, we are constantly improving performance and fixing bugs in Firefox, but A-Frame is separate, yes. I think A-Frame will always be separate. We don't want to privilege one library over another, but it does let us learn what are the pain points and where we should focus efforts. So I think we are out of time. I am not rushing off anywhere, so I'm happy to answer any other questions uh, afterwards. Thank you all very much. Thank you so much, Josh. Let's have another round of applause for Josh Maranacci.